Hello, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this very exciting event um, about the book, All We Can Save. I have the book here uh, in front of me. Uh, my name is Kate Orff, and I'm a professor at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, Preservation. And I have the distinct honor of welcoming um, uh, our uh, one of our co the co-editor of this amazing book, um, Catherine Wilkinson, and um, some other contributors, uh, fellow contributors, Kate Marvel, Jamie Babishi, uh, to, to this event tonight. I'm really excited to just kind of have an informal sharing session, learn more about the event, and then sort of talk, learn more about the book and kind of talk about um, the future of this amazing uh, effort that has turned really into a project, the All We Can Save project. So um, I, I wanted to give a very brief introduction of um, our panelists and these co-authors, starting with the um, co-editor, Catherine Wilkinson, whose energy is astounding and, uh, and, and always sort of inspiring. Um, Catherine, it's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit during this process. So here's her bio. Catherine Wilkinson is an author, strategist, and teacher working to heal the planet we call home. Her writings include The Drawdown Review, New York Times bestseller, Drawdown, and Between God and Green. She holds, I thought very interestingly, a PhD in geography and environment from the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar, among other degrees. And so Catherine, it's amazing to have you. And I know uh, your fearless co-editor, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, uh, is is uh, someone who is so powerful in this space, and uh, we're all kind of rooting for both of you in this incredible initiative that you have started. So we are also joined today by Kate Marvel, who is a client sci climate scientist and writer living in New York City. She has a doctorate in astrophysics, and she's <laughs> and interestingly, she wrote in her bio, and she knows Earth is the best place in the entire universe. Kate is also a teacher at Columbia University. And we also have Janie Babishi, who leads New York City's efforts to prepare for the impacts of climate change. She's previously worked in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Honolulu, Hawaii, and her essay in the book very beautifully weaves together stories of these three places. So I'm so excited that we're having this event now. And today when we were scheduling it, it was like, hmm, let's push it towards after inauguration. And no one could have imagined the sort of chain of events that happened in between that moment when we thought to convene this group and, uh, and the inauguration uh, yesterday. So it's very exciting to, to be gathered. It feels like a breath of fresh air, um, a moment really to, to think, to be positive, and to sort of imagine in a more expansive way exactly as all we can save does uh, about our future together on the earth, on the planet, and think big about infrastructure and, um, and, and how we can work together. So the structure and flow of this evening is um, Catherine will be giving a very, very thick introduction to the book and the concepts followed by the three of us, our con contributors. And then we'll have a question and answer session towards the end. So if you have questions, uh, you can type them into the Q&A box. So without any further ado, uh, Catherine, I invite you to share your vision and your work on All We Can Save with all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, it's really good to be with you all, um, even though I can't see you. <laughs> um, I can, can feel the group um, that is gathered tonight. Um, Kate, you're very kind. Uh, I feel like I was a little obnoxious as an editor, so <laughs> I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that, um, but that didn't tarnish tarnish my reputation too much. Um, and I'm also really glad to be having this conversation after the inauguration and really what feels like a new day um, for climate action solutions justice in, in this country. Um, it was quite, there were so many remarkable things that happened yesterday, but I thought it was quite astounding that in the inaugural address, 
uh, the planet itself was quoted. Um, that was, a, I think, quite a remarkable first. Um, I want to begin with the words that actually open the book, All We Can Save. Uh, it's a, a closing stanza of a poem by Adrian Rich called Natural Resources. And she writes, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age perversely with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. And that stanza of that poem, as you have probably gathered, really unlocked the title that this book came to claim as its own. Um, there are 41 essays, 17 poems, and original art in this collection. So it was very hard <laughs> to, to find a title that was adequately expansive um, and that didn't fall into either of those classic traps and I think fundamental failings of climate communication, which is either utter doom and gloom or Pollyanna optimism. Um, and the title where we landed, All We Can Save, um, we felt has an honesty about where we are without losing a gaze towards what is still possible. And of course, the shift from that line in Adrian Rich's poem, All I Cannot Save, to All That We Still Can. Um, and to get there, right, to get to all we can save, it's going to take linking arms and it's going to take what we named in the subtitle of the book, which is truth, courage, and solutions. Um, and all three of the pieces um, by both Kates and one Janie <laughs> um, really bring all three of those things in spades. So I'm really excited for each of them to share a bit about their pieces and perspectives tonight. Um, this book actually has its origins uh, in a rage hike. <laughs> um, I, I had been thinking for some time about the need for a collection like this, um, but like a lot of ideas, they sort of sit on the shelf and get kicked around, but they don't really go anywhere. And Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and I found ourselves um, kind of co facilitating a round table on climate solutions during a summit at the Aspen Institute. And the gathering sort of struck us anew in a lack of diversity of voices um, or a sidelining of more diverse voices. Um, and at some point we strapped up our hiking boots and uh, went on a rage hike. <laughs> Along along the Roaring Fork River and kind of through these incredible aspen trees, um, and we were grappling with the moment that we were in um, and the leadership crisis that is at the heart of the climate crisis and the shortchanging that we see happening so much in the movement um, for women a shortage of credit, a shortage of funding, a shortage of resources, um, less access to microphones, platforms, uh, you name it, in literally every sector where climate decision-making is happening, there is not gender equal representation. Um, and in some of those sectors, very, very far from gender equal representation. And Ayana and I both firmly believe that if we're going to transform society in large part this decade, right? Science has made very clear that that is the task at hand. It's going to take transformational leadership to do that work. And we believe that that is leadership that is both more characteristically feminine and also more committedly feminist. 
Um, so we've come to think about the work that we do together as celebrating, um, shouting from the rafters, uh, and, and ultimately supporting and nurturing a feminist climate renaissance. Um, and it's worth noting right here at the beginning that that is not limited to any gender. It just so happens that we are seeing women bring to the movement in droves this upwelling of compassion, care, connection, community building, creativity, collaboration, and deep commitment to justice. And the aim of this book is to support, to accelerate um, the shift in, in not only who is leading, but how we lead in this critical moment um, for life on earth. Um, so we're not, suggesting by any means that we need only women, but that we do need a full spectrum of climate leadership and all of the diverse superpowers um, and ways of change making um, that, that we can get. Um, as we were working on the book, it became very clear that it wanted to be more than a book. So we have also launched kind of a sister <laughs> nonprofit uh, called the All We Can Save Project, um, which will aim to do a few things, um, to continue giving voice to climate feminist ideas, stories, and perspectives, uh, which is exactly what this book has tried to do. We hope that we will be able to raise many millions of dollars <laughs> and actually invest in the work of feminist climate leaders. Um, we're hoping that we can also nurture kind of next gen or new gen feminist climate leaders, whether that is inviting climate folks into a more justice centered um, and feminist perspective, whether it's inviting feminists into the climate space um, and everything in between and beyond. Um, and, and to build community. So not at all disconnected from, from some of what we're doing tonight. Um, all movements for social change depend on a relational strength in the movement. And historically, I think we've really underinvested in that in in the climate movement. Um, and it's something that we're really keen to shift um, from things like all we can save circles, which some of you may have already participated in um, that started to unfold this fall and are uh, expanding in really delightful ways. Um, we're hoping that we can can really help build build community around this this work. Um, and the work that we need to do together, right? To, to strengthen the we in all we can save. Um, I think, Kate, I will leave that there. Um, that feels like enough context. Um, and let's have Janie join the conversation um, to share a bit about her piece um, uh, and, uh, and some of her insights. Thanks, Catherine. Um, that was really a beautiful framing. So my, my essay in the book is called A Tale of Three Cities. And um, as Kate mentioned in my intro, I um, uh, talk about my experience working on climate adaptation in New Orleans, Louisiana, Honolulu, Hawaii, and of course, New York, um, and uh, weave together some themes about working on climate adaptation in each of these coastal cities. Um, I wanted to start my presentation off by showing you some warming stripes. Um, I imagine that um, this audience is pretty familiar with what these stripes represent. They um, chronologically represent uh, temperatures um, here showing the global scale, the, the temperatures in the US and then locally here in New York um, over a period of about a hundred years. Um, and the trend is clear. Um, our earth is warming um, and that has consequences um, for um, our society and our communities. Um, and we've seen those consequences in action. Um, these are some images from the extreme weather we saw over the last year. Um, we had one of the most um, active hurricane seasons on record, um, Atlantic hurricane seasons on record 
devastating wildfires in the West. And one of the hottest years we've ever seen on record, only two hundredths of a degree cooler than uh, 2016, which is the hottest year on record. And so as we work um, in the field of climate change to decarbonize our economy, we must also work to prepare for the impacts that we know we cannot avoid um, because of what the trends have been and um, uh, because of, of uh, the, the, the fact that we our action on, on climate is, is um, uh, coming um, later than, um, than it needed to to have avoided these impacts. And so I wanted to tell the story of what I've learned um, from working on adaptation in, in these three cities, like I said. Um, I start with New Orleans. Um, and you know, I should mention that um, because the essay is based on my experiences in these cities, um, they are really snapshots in time. Um, and I haven't necessarily followed um, the work uh, in these cities um, beyond these snapshots. So uh, I just wanna be clear about what I'm able to represent here. Um, but this picture that um, I have on the screen is um, an image of in, the infamous green dot map as it uh, became known uh, as um, uh, over the years. Um, it was a map that was shown at um, the mayor appointed Bring New Orleans Back Commission meeting back in 2006. Um, it was really the first time New Orleans residents that were uh, eager to hear about recovery and rebuilding um, in their city uh, we're hearing about the city's plans um, for how that recovery would unfold. And the green dots here represent uh, neighborhoods that were low-lying neighborhoods, um, in many cases, long established African-American neighborhoods that were designated and announced for the first time at this meeting as neighborhoods that would be returned to green space. So the implication was that people living in these neighborhoods would not be able to rebuild um, and they would have to move. As you can imagine, um, this news was, was uh, not well received, especially because there had been no community engagement done um, in advance of um, this, this map being presented. And so the mayor quickly realized the political fallout um, from this plan and uh, changed course um, and declared a few weeks later that no community would be off limits. Um, instead, the US Army Corps ended up building a $14 billion a uh, complex levy system to protect every community in, in the city. Um, I'll come back to that levy system in a second, but um, you know, by, by um, changing course, um, I think questions still remained about whether these neighborhoods were safe to live in. Um, and that question never really got resolved. Um, a great geographer in, in New Orleans, Richard Campanella, who works at Tulane, um, ended up calling this the great footprint debate. Um, he uh, juxtaposed the social stance from the scientific stance. The science said that some of these neighborhoods were not safe to live in over the long term and um, scientifically based on the projections, it made sense to leave them. Um, the social stance was that it was unfair to uh, require communities um, that have had very established roots in these places um, to leave and what did it mean for their assets and their well-being and the, the fabric of their communities that they came so heavily to rely on. Um, that was never resolved. Uh, and like I said, the levy system was built. Um, just recently, a few years ago, the Army Corps has said that the levy system will only protect from um, hurricane force storm surge until 2023. Um, and so there's still an open question about how to protect these communities in the long term. And I think that the story also gets just to the question about where are we going to be able to live in the long term? And then which communities will we have to end up leaving? Um, I then talked about my experience in Honolulu. Um, I worked in Honolulu um, uh, on a public-private partnership um, to uh, pursue multi-sectoral uh, solutions to climate change and disaster risk reduction. And um, we, uh, I was also involved in, in a uh, project to bring together uh, different stakeholders in the tourism industry um, uh, to figure out how to provide long-term protections and adaptation solutions in Wa Waikiki Beach. Um, Waikiki Beach brings in about 42% of the state's tourism revenue, $2 billion a year. So it's an incredibly important economic engine economically. Um, it is also very, very susceptible to coastal erosion. This uh, image that I'm showing here is a Google Earth image that highlights some of the natural streams 
and natural wetlands um, that used to exist in this area. Um, some of the areas shaded in green were actually uh, taro fields and taro patches uh, before um, the development that you can see here took place. Um, here the story is really about uh, trying to chase a, an ever-changing um, challenge and, um, uh, and, and, and not knowing exactly how much time the solutions that we're pursuing will be able to buy. So, um, you know, there are some complexities in terms of the, the types of solutions that can protect Waikiki Beach and whether or not they will actually be able to um, uh, preserve some of the recreational amenities that Waikiki Beach has, has um, come to be known for. For example, if you um, build breakwaters out in Waikiki Beach, it will actually have the impact of breaking the surf, um, which uh, as, as you may all know, um, Waikiki Beach of course is, is known for. And so um, th there, are, there are some challenges in exactly the types of solutions, but then there are also uh, challenges in um, both paying for those solutions. And like I said, um, understanding exactly how long those solutions will last and how much time those solutions will, will present the beach. Um, and if ultimately um, those solutions can keep up with the rate of erosion that the beach is experiencing due to sea level rise, or if um, much more uh, bolder uh, actions must be taken um, to either preserve the beach or, or um, accept that the beach cannot be preserved. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think that the lesson that um, I learned in Honolulu is that adaptation is a process. Um, there are some short-term solutions, um, some, some short-term investments um, being made and building some jetties that will keep the sand in place and keep it from eroding on the beach. Um, we will see how long uh, those solutions um, provide the beach. Um, and then uh, adaptation planners will continue ha to have to um, decide whether or not to make bigger and bolder investments um, uh, to keep up with the rate of erosion, or um, like I said, move in a different direction. Um, and then that brings me to New York, um, where I currently live and work. Um, this is a rendering of the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. It's a project that will ultimately protect 110,000 residents, 28,000 of whom live in um, public housing in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. This is a community that was really devastated by Hurricane Sandy and um, the city received um, uh, some uh, catalyst money, I would call it, from the federal government that ultimately seeded the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. Um, community engagement has been an incredibly important part of the story of this project. Um, we sought out to build a project that was not just going to protect this community from future storm surge and sea level rise, but rather also create new amenities for this community. Um, the community told us that they wanted to make sure that they had better waterfront access. So we're replacing the rickety bridges that cross the FDR into the East, Side, East River Park um, with uh, universally accessible bridges, which will create a much more welcoming um, entrance into the park um, and will be more accommodating for wheelchairs and strollers. The community also said that currently the park um, has, uh, you know, many amenities, um, fields and tracks and uh, courts, but they're all fenced off and there aren't really those interstitial spaces where families can gather and have picnics and just be with each other outside. So we're making sure that we're building those kinds of spaces into the new park that will be built here. The flood protection will be at the water's edge. Um, so when you're in the park, you actually won't even see it. The park will be built higher than it is now. Um, and uh, one of our goals for the project was to ensure that we don't wall ourselves off from the water, that um, the flood protection is really integrated into the waterfront. So our goal here was, um, and, and I think the lesson here is that we can realize the potential of um, transforming our communities um, with investments that we're making in climate adaptation um, and really achieve multiple benefits um, uh, and, and, and really achieve community driven planning process that uh, allow communities to thrive um, and, and be more vibrant in the face of climate change. So as I um, reflect on all of these experiences and think about the future of coastal cities, um, I think there are a couple of lessons um, that really stand out to me. One is that we really need to be mainstreaming the incorporation or consideration of future climate risks into everything we do. 
Um, this uh, image here is one that we use in New York City as we talk about our work um, of a multi-layered strategy. We've got coastal strategies at the waterfront's edge. We have 520 miles of coastline here in New York, so those are important. But we're also accounting for future climate risks in buildings, infrastructure, and then finally equipping our residents and businesses to um, make more informed decisions in the face of climate change. But this is the kind of strategy that I think um, all cities must employ. We need to be thinking about climate risks in every land use decision and every housing development and every infrastructure decision. We also need to make sure that we're being driven by equity and inclusion. Um, you know, the, the reason that we um, uh, focus on systems like coastal infrastructure buildings and infrastructure um, is so that we don't have to burden residents with the um, responsibility or the expectation that they will bounce back after every disaster. If we build more infrastructure systems, if we build more resilient systems, we will be able to um, uh, absorb the shock of those extreme events there rather than um, uh, uh, be, be relying on residents themselves to bounce back. Um, and then, you know, I think another important piece of this is just the question of how we pay for this work. Um, two of the cities that I talked about, um, the adaptation solutions that they ended up implementing um, required billions of dollars of federal dollars to flow uh, after disasters. Um, Honolulu, in that case, they ended up taxing coastal businesses in Waikiki in order to pay for the, the, the groins that they're building, um, the rock jetties that they're building. And so, um, you know, I think there's a question about how we pay for it and, and, and when, when the support from the federal government comes into play, we really need to be able to access federal dollars in advance of a disaster to take this action that's inherently proactive rather than in, in reactively after a disaster. So I think I will leave it there um, and uh, pass it off to the next presenter, um, but I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Janie. Um, the next Kate, I will I will be the next Kate up. Um, and um, I will say, oh, good, Kate Markle, you're there too. Do you want to go next? Uh, whichever, yeah, let me know. Uh, okay, why don't you go? Um, I'll go because I, I'll follow Janie and we were in the same section. So I'll- Excellent. Uh, and then you can end on a, a bigger zoomed out note. Um, so, Thanks, Janie. And I, I thought I would actually start with Catherine um, and Ayana uh, put together the book in these amazing sections. And they have a, a part in the introduction that um, captures each of these sections in a poem, uh, uh, what she called like light brushstrokes. And so the sections are root, advocate, reframe, reshape, persist, feel, nourish, and rise. But I thought um, as Janie was speaking to um, uh, kind of read this mini poem um, that Catherine and Ayana put together. Problems embedded in the contours of cities, transport, infrastructure, capitalism, coastlines and landscapes where human nature meet, much to reconsider, rend, invert, and remake. Great. So um, Catherine mentioned that she was a tough editor and that's mostly because I've put in maybe 10 pages and 15 images and there are no images in this book. So I thought to kind of take a leap and actually just read my text from the book um, and uh, throw it out there. And it's about a seven minute segment. So bear with me, it's called Mending the Landscape and it's part of the, the reshape section. My hometown, Crofton, Maryland, is typical of many middle-class developments of the 1960s with its wide streets, single family houses, two car garages, and of course, a golf course. A frontier suburb on former farmland, it was a pleasant, considered, and rather unremarkable setting. It was also a local harbinger of global change. Car-centric logic increasing auto emissions, standalone homes demanding large loads of electricity, and sprawl accelerating habitat fragmentation. During my lifetime, our neighborhood pond stopped freezing over for ice skating in the winter, became choked with algae in the summer, and eventually dried up for two years straight, filling with bird and fish carcasses and alarming local residents. Fueled by subsidized gasoline and publicly funded road networks, the carbon intensive backdrop of suburban sprawl has reached its zenith in the United States and has been replicated around the world in various forms for the past decades. While planners and landscape architects were busy laying out suburbia, the world's ecosystems were being degraded, polluted, and torn apart. 
Habitat fragmentation and toxic pollutants created the biodiversity crisis, sprawling development, which discouraged community life, contributed to a social crisis, and exploding greenhouse gas emissions precipitated the climate crisis. These three interrelated crises will define the planning and design professions for the next century. To be a landscape architect today is to wake up each morning with sorrow and guilt, as well as a sense of mission. My goal as a design teacher and practicing landscape architect is to reimagine re my profession as a form of collective gardening. At the same time that Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Mokes, two prominent early adopters of the term landscape architecture, made their iconic mark with Central Park in New York, the salt marshes of Jamaica Bay on its outskirts were being used as New York City's trash heap. Highways and bridges came much later. Shoreline gradients were concretized, islands were impounded into straight land masses for two airports, and sewage flowed freely for decades. The recent revitalization of Jamaica Bay shows how to mend and love landscapes moving forward. The bay was once thick with cord grass and teeming with shellfish and flounder, but the shellfish population collapsed during the 20th century for, from overharvesting and raw sewage. And in recent decades, marshlands that once cushioned against extreme weather started to slough off into open water, succumbing to pollution and rising sea levels. By the 1990s, the landscape was literally drowning. Local activists, birders, fishermen, and conservationists band together to track and publicize the marsh's imminent disappearance and habitat loss for hundreds of species. Federal, state, and local action converged at times prompted by, yes, lawsuits in response to this landscape emergency. New York City and New York State acted to address pollution and improve water quality. The US Army Corps of Engineers and the National Park Service embarked on an island building process that reused dredged spoils to replenish starved marshlands, spraying on layers of sediment. Local volunteers began planting cord grass, critical to salt marsh ecosystems, and oyster gardening to reseed the shellfish and mussels that stabilize the sand that together hold cord grass roots in place. I've learned four lessons from Jamaica Bay, now a beloved living and recovering landscape that can inform our collective gardening and landscape architects' climate action. One, visualize the invisible. Two, foster ecosystems as infrastructure. Three, create participatory processes. And four, scale it up. So I'm gonna skip to the, the scale it up section. And in the interim, I have just examples of, of what I mean by those kind of four calls to action. So to conclude, scale it up. From individual oyster to functional reef, to healthy baylands, to vast blue thriving ocean, the idea of scale is embedded in living landscapes. There are multiple scales of human action too, from the gardening and garden at your doorstep to a restored forest at the edge of town, to regional watershed policy, to national legislation and beyond. We need all of these scales to mend the earth. It's time to redesign the mighty Mississippi as a living river system, reconnecting the river with its floodplain and coastal basins. The Dutch have implemented a room for the river program along the Rhine, aimed at giving the river more space and ability to cope with high volumes of water. A future Mississippi River National Park could take a similar approach to reverse the US Army Corps of Engineers practice of concretization and control and its unintended consequences. Iowa pig farmers, Arkansas bird watchers, and Louisiana oystermen would all benefit from letting the river reconnect with its shoals in the upper watershed and from nourishing the Mississippi Delta with land building sediment. An aspirational project like this could knit the center of our country together and reclaim the river as a recreational linear park rather than a waste canal. The Mississippi helped build this country. We need her help again in the climate crisis. Our nation's coastlines also call for bold aspiration. Today, the National Flood Insurance Program provides funds to rebuild flooded properties exactly and where they are, often putting people back in harm's way. Rather than being an instrument for equitable adaptation, disaster response, and managed retreat from rising rivers and seas, it exacerbates the income divide by giving payouts to already wealthy homeowners, sometimes even for vacation home. What's more, the flood insurance program is already over $20 billion in debt. 
In its place, we need a federal buyout policy that enables families to choose proactively to move. Research has shown that many people want to and feel proud to leave their land in buyout programs and are willing to give it back to mother nature. Let's embrace a fresh vision for an interconnected and publicly owned national, American National Shoreway, which could be made possible by encouraging retreat, funding equitable relocation, and rebuilding protective shorelines as linear parks that maximize public access at the water's edge. Mending the fabric of the physical landscape at a local scale, as in Jamaica Bay, or at a regional scale, as the Mississippi River National Park would, which shows a way forward. Reviving our nation's green-blue infrastructure is the collective work of our time. Stitching ecological connections is good for vibrant and healthy, healthy communities, animals with migratory lifelines, food systems supported by living soils, and the global, global carbon cycle and climate. Mending some things will also require tearing up and dismantling others. Equit equitably unbuilding places in harm's way, depaving roads, blowing up dams, ripping out concretized street channels, jackhammering asphalt, and cutting down sterile seawalls that push risk downstream. Acts of design contend to the rights of the channelized river, the clam, and the muck, and the climate mi migrant to survive and thrive. It's time to get our hands in the mud, in the mud. Let's actively love and mend our messy, swampy, dusty, busted up landscapes. The tide pools for darting crabs, dark forests for scarlet tanagers, dead trees for owls and bats, thick grassy dunes for nesting plo plovers. Tending to and dwelling among our living landscapes can start small. Plastic pickups, piling up logs for habitat, gardening with oysters, and pulling invasive ivy from that patch of tulip trees down the block. We face a global landscape emergency. Let's knit what we can back together. And that's the end of my, my passage. And uh, I'll kick it over to Kate, Kate Marvel and just say that one of the other amazing things that Ayana and Catherine did with this book is, is intersperse poems and sketches and drawings. And uh, I was so incredibly excited to read lots of poems about mud and dirt. And there's so many, there's always a new, a new thing when you open up the book. So. Kate, I'll kick it to you. Hello, hi. Um, so thank you so much, Kate. Um, so I guess I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I am a research scientist at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and I teach in the MA program in climate and society at Columbia. So I think a lot about climate Kate, change. real quick, I don't mm -hmm. think, I don't see your camera. If you could just, there we go. Okay, you know? okay all right, great. Um, okay, so did you did you hear that though? Yes. All right. Awesome. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think a lot about climate change um, and I have a lot of feelings um, and some of these feelings are informed by my background in astrophysics um, because when you study the entire universe, you learn very quickly that, that other planets are garbage. Um, space looks pretty and it's really cool, but fundamentally it wants to kill you. Um, and so the fact that we live here on the only good planet, it fills me with wonder and, and gratitude. Um, but being a scientist, there is another narrative that I hear. And that's a really reductive narrative that, oh, science will save us. Um, all we have to do is sit back and wait and await a techno utopia that's going to be given to us by billionaires or the free market or some nebulous thing called innovation. Um, and kind of a subset of that science will save us narrative is something called geoengineering, um, which is the notion that, well, Modifying the climate inadvertently has gone so well, we should just modify it deliberately. Um, and I was thinking about geoengineering um, and it was making me sad and grumpy and afraid. Um, so I wanted to talk in this essay about all of these feelings, about this sense of wonder and hope and gratitude and thankfulness and also this, this fear and grumpiness about techno solutions. Um, and I love this planet and I think I love it in all of its complexity. So what I wanted to do in this essay was talk about the complexity of the planet as a cautionary tale, um, but also something that we should really celebrate. 
Um, so I'm just going to read um, the first couple pages of this essay, um, and it's called A Handful of Dust. It rains in the Amazon because the trees want it to. There is plenty of moisture in the oceans that surround the continent, but there is also a hidden reservoir on the land, feeding an invisible river that flows upward to the sky. The water held in the soil is lifted up by the bodies of the trees and lost to the atmosphere through the surfaces of their leaves. The local sky plumps with moisture, primed for the arrival of the seasonal rains driven by the annual back and forth march of the sun's rays. As the scientist Alex Hall puts it, the trees are co-conspiring with the sky to attract an earlier monsoon. One night in the future, a jet takes off from an obscure equatorial airstrip deep in the Amazon. It is an ordinary Gulf Stream, an unassuming workhorse for the world's wealthy. Today, though, there are no passengers aboard. It carries only secrets. From the windows of the jet, the pilot cannot see the forest below, only a blue sky interrupted by a white patchwork, alternately thick and wispy, that hides every hint of green and brown. But it is those forests and the people who live in them and the people far afield who may breathe in oxygen they breathe out that the pilot is trying to save. The forests are dying, attacked on all sides by relentless demand for fossil fuels, beef, money. Humans start fires as the temperature warms every season becomes fire season. As the atmosphere is larded with carbon dioxide, the plants of the Amazon do not need to open the pores on their leaves quite so much to take in the gases they need. These shrunken pores expel less water into the atmosphere. The trees are losing their ability to summon the monsoon, slowly becoming decoupled from the surrounding air, a forest dissolving into dust. Miles above the ground, the jet jettisons its cargo, mineral sunscreen to be injected into the swirling air currents. The tiny particles will be smeared on the stratosphere, a protective aerosol shield that will block a little sunlight that would otherwise warm the planet. It is a Hail Mary, a desperate attempt to cool the planet by blocking the sun. They call it geoengineering, geo, the Greek for earth, engineer from the middle English for contrive, deceive, put to torture. It is not a good idea but it has happened before. It is still dark when the plane returns to the airstrip, but in the darkness, the lights of this jet and others returning from the same mission shine brightly. The next morning, the sun rises in a blaze of brilliant red. It is the most beautiful sunrise anyone can remember. It lasts only a few minutes before the rains come again. The year is 1816 and there will be no summer. In New England and Canada, Brutal May frosts kill the crops. A housewife notes in her diary simply, weather backward. The Indian Ocean monsoon, usually triggered by warm summer temperatures, is delayed by months. When it finally comes to the subcontinent, the torrential rains drown croplands and the people who work them, leaving pools of stagnant, filthy water. Cholera spreads as far as Moscow. Harvests fail in Northern Europe, fraying societies battered by the Napoleonic Wars. Switzerland, Switzerland, is racked by violence as desperate, starving mobs converge on the cities. What history most remembers from the carnage spreading across the Northern Hemisphere that year is the aftermath of a bad vacation. In a villa on Lake Geneva, a group of bored English tourists challenge one another to write ghost stories. It is cold. Nearly every day of June and July has been rainy. The gloom, dulled perhaps by heavy opium use and sexual tension, inspires Lord Byron and his doctor and frenemy, John William Polidori, to create the outlines of the vampire tale that would become Dracula. But it is the novel written by the teenage girl trapped inside with these insufferable men that will become most known to posterity. The soggy, relentless weather gave birth to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and his tragic, violent, misunderstood monster. Is it any wonder that we scientists, tarred for eternity by this portrayal of hubris and vanity, are curious to understand the circumstances under which it came about? The culprit, suppressor of summer, bringer of rain, Gothic muse, is to be found on Sumbawa, one of the lesser Sunda islands in what was then the Dutch East Indies and is now Indonesia, on the Snagar Peninsula, among cashew peninsula cashew plantations and a few scattered small villages, you can see the remains of what was once a perfectly formed volcanic cone. In April of 1815, Mount Tambora erupted, blasting gas and dust high into the stratosphere and directly killing over 10,000 islanders. It was by far the most destructive explosion in human history. Few Europeans would have known of the eruption. Information traveled slowly in those early industrial times, and the news of an obscure volcano blowing up in an out-of-the-way colony would not have been of general interest. But the violence of the event and its tropical location meant that its ejecta were very effectively injected 
into the upper atmosphere. From there, stratospheric winds took over, dispersing the fog of volcanic gas and dust to far off skies. Frankenstein was a scientist. The monster was nameless. It never existed, except as a metaphor for curiosity turned to hubris and then tragedy. The future with its sunscreen smearing jets and its desperate attempts to cool the planet is presumably imaginary for now. But today, from the safety of our climate controlled offices, scientists can set off multiple tamboras, a few lines of code and the volcano is doubled in size or moved halfway around the world. We can make it explode millions of years ago or in the next decade. We've built toy planets, climate models that live on supercomputers and we can manipulate them like malevolent gods. We can run experiments on the entire earth and repeat them over and over until we've learned something. By setting off volcanoes in these models, we now know the conditions under which they can cool the planet and what happens after they do. And we've learned another thing. Tambora was not unique. Plot the average temperature of the globe and the graph's rising line will be punctuated by the occasional sharp downward spike. Krakatoa in 1883, then the 20th century eruptions of Santa Maria, Ogong, El Chuchon, and finally Pinatubo in 1991. Five explosions since Tambora, powerful enough to spray gas and dust far up into the stratosphere. The sun blocking effects were powerful. Pinatubo, co Pinatubo cooled the planet by an entire degree, but short lived. Eventually the atmosphere cleansed itself and the protective shield of tiny particles disintegrated and fell to earth. Imagine though, if volcanoes exploded like clockwork, one every few years, spewing a regular injection of gas and dust high into the stratosphere. Imagine controlled explosions that require no mountain, no cinder cone, no flow of lava onto farmlands below. Imagine in short, if we were the volcano. So I'll stop there and you'll have to read the rest of the essay to see if whether I think that's a good idea. Thank you. I, I was reading along too, so it was extra special to hear your, your voice kind of echoing through, Kate. Um, I was going to start us off with maybe one or two questions, and I know there's a bunch of questions already in the, in the Q&A um, kind of section, but um, one of the things I, I wanted to just talk about, because we're here, um, at least at, at, in, in the auspices, in the virtual space, but in the, at, at Columbia University, and, you know, I was, I was wondering if maybe you could reflect on, I mean, this book as a sort of a teaching tool, or it has so many sort of generational lessons in, embedded in it. Um, I know I'm, I'm teaching a seminar, uh, looking at this book, re you reading this book in, in different forms. Um, Columbia in, it, in itself um, is, is starting a, a climate school and I think still working through what that means. And I think, you know, Kate, I know you're involved in that in some way. So I guess I would love to hear a little bit more um, uh, uh, from reflections from, from you all about like, what, what does this mean now in terms of our next generation in terms of teaching and and it's 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 it, hearing you speak Kate you know you're not not referring to you know graphs and charts I used to we used to be pointing at you know carbon dioxide charts and all of a sudden this book comes out and and takes a completely different approach um, that is more holistic and 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 sort of dwells within the sort of mind and the the soul so could you talk a little bit about um, about that notion of, of how you see it um, working in, in an educational space or, or lessons to learn here? Okay, Catherine, maybe you can take that one first. Yeah, uh, ha happy to jump in. Um, I actually had the very unexpected and delightful opportunity to teach the book um, in an undergraduate seminar in the fall. So. I guess probably the first course uh, that got to use all we can save because uh, it didn't come out until late September, but I had access to the book. <laughs> um, and um, I taught it actually technically in a religious studies department. Um, so the course was called The Call of Climate. Um, these were mostly not environmental studies majors or, um, you know, environmental arts and humanities folks. There were, there were some of those, um, but there was a very last minute um, issue with a professor who suddenly couldn't teach this last semester. So there were a bunch of kids who ended up in this class that hadn't really chosen it, uh, which was quite 
interesting actually. Um, and there were some wonderful things that happened. Um, one of the one of the young women in the class, when uh, we had our first week of reading the book, and she read the begin, which kind of in not too many pages maps out the the intersection of climate and gender equality, among other things. Um, and she said, while I was reading the, the begin of the book, I was shaking because I felt so empowered. Um, and what happened over the course of the semester is that I just watched all of these young people go from kind of hanging on the sidelines, right, for the most part um, of the climate movement, kind of thinking like, well, that's definitely a thing that's an issue, but like, it's not my issue, or I don't know how to engage with that. I don't know what the meaning of my voice would be in this space. Um, and, and to sort of build a relationship um, with climate justice and with what it means to work towards a livable future. Um, and to realize that, yes, this is about science. And yes, this is about policy. And it's about engineering. But it's also about psychology. And it's about the arts. And it's that there are so many ways in to working on climate in some way or another and that literally whatever your superpowers are we need them right we need all of them in the movement um and so i'm particularly excited about this book being not just a tool for kind of topical learning and engagement um but there's also kind of a vocational exploration piece of the book because you all and other contributors share parts of your stories, right? And the journeys that you've been on. And um, in some cases, the dead ends that have been taken, right? There's like, there's a, there's kind of a, an intimacy about the work that you don't often get um, in in climate content. So I'm really excited for it to be hopefully picked up in all sorts of disciplines, um, because I think there is relevance and, and resonance um, in, in virtually every one of them. Um, but also that it may create these openings, right? And create opportunities for imagination um, that hopefully welcome people in um, to, you know, to the to the movement that that we're trying to build. Um, yeah. Uh, Kate Marvel, did you you want to talk? I mean, I, I guess it might be interesting to hear you reflect a little bit on, you know, I believe you teach in climate and society, if that's correct. Any reflections there on, on how this kind of book or philosophy kind of impacts how you teach or? Um, so I know that Catherine and Ayana share this um, opinion that the divide between what is art and what is science is, is very silly. Um, and we spend so much time and effort sorting people into categories. You are a technical person, you are a social science person, you are an arts person. And, and those categories are really, really arbitrary. Um, and so, you know, what I, what I take from this is that um, really it's important to break down those barriers. Um, but also I think it's incumbent on us as kind of more senior people to try to shape the world that our students are going to graduate into. Um, I see in the wider world, there is an incredible hunger for scientists who can communicate, people who can take the science and help other people use it or tell stories with it. Uh, and there's so many students who want to do that. So there's a huge supply and there's a huge demand and somehow there's a mismatch between those. Um, and I would like to do more to try to get rid of that bottleneck. 
I, I also see that every day. I mean, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned like the we were shaping the world that that we're, you know, making making this bridge with our students and 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 telling the story. And, and Janie, in your your piece, I was really struck by your your personal story too, because I think, you know, you're an amazing example of somebody who's I don't want to say job description, but didn't exist, <laughs> you know, maybe even 10 years ago. The fact that you're sort of, you know, leading um, at a city scale adaptation, community engagement. Um, this is kind of a whole new sort of sets of skills that somehow you've managed to combine. So I guess I, I'd be also interested in, in hearing from you because your your talk also stressed on stressed community engagement and communication of some of these issues. If, um, you know, what are, what are, what are, do you think some of the qualities that kind of contributed to, and to some degree, like defining your own path and, and sort of being able to sort of chart this path of like a resilience expert, a resilience officer, if you will, and in a governmental context? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I, I think I was drawn to the field of resilience before we even really called it that. Um, and I, I think what drew me to it was, was the fact that it was so incredibly interdisciplinary. So, you know, I, I felt like we, um, uh, policymaking spaces were often siloed between you know, social policy, economic policy, and environmental policy, and often um, the most impactful solutions really existed in the intersection of all three. And um, disasters at first, and then um, a more long-term view on climate change gave me a lens to actually sort of sit in that intersection and, 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 and think about policy more holistically, which is what attracted me to it. But I think it really, um, that experience really builds on Kate's point about um, breaking down silos between disciplines and, and thinking about the, the, the work of, of addressing and confronting the climate crisis really requires holistic and cross-disciplinary solutions. And so we need to bring together people of all different skill sets or all different superpowers, as Catherine says. Um, and, and I think, you know, just to reflect on your previous question, I'm not a, a teacher, but I um, and haven't taught the book, but but I, I think I've had my own teachable moments um, that that have been spurred by the book. Um, and I just want to share one because I, it, it was so interesting for me and I continue to reflect on it even though it happened, you know, um, uh, about six weeks ago. So I was on one of these kinds of panels with another co-author, Sarah Miller, who wrote a, a great essay in the book about talking to um, real estate agents in Miami as if she was going to buy a home um, and uh, asking the question about sea level rise impacts and really not ever getting a very straight answer. Um, and it led to this conversation um, on the panel where, you know, she said, well, if I met a chief resilience officer at a party, I wouldn't think they're a bad person, but like <laughs> essentially sort of um, alluding to the fact that the, the work of resilience was potentially or adaptation was potentially getting in the way of um, uh, the work of decarbonization, right? Like if, if we, if, if we uh, put too much faith in the work of resilience, if we to, to put too much stock in it, then are we really convincing ourselves that we don't have to take other kinds of climate action? Um, and it was such an interesting moment for me from, I had never heard that, that, that perception before. And so like, even that conversation really made me step back and reflect and think, well, am I a bad person? Like, am I, am I doing the work that needs to be done? And, and, you know, it, it, and, and obviously it was more nuanced than that, but, but, but it, it, it really has led to these conversations that I typically have not encountered in my, um, in the course of my career and my, my, in my day-to-day -day work. And, and I, I just, they're thought provoking, you know, they're, they're making me better at communicating my work. And, um, and I, I hope will effective, uh, 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 eventually make me more effective at doing my work. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that tidbit, because I, I, um, I feel like I've just had my own experiences of, of learning from the process of this book, uh, beyond writing the essay, um, but actually just sharing perspectives with the other, other authors. Great. And, you know, I, I do feel like the other silo, um, Heather McGee has a great quote in the book, book, maybe Catherine, you remember it, but I was trying to, but yeah. it's something about climate and democracy is the answer to both. I mean, I also, what do you recall the full quote? 
Yeah, uh, she says that that climate and inequality are the mm -hmm. great challenges of our time. I'm paraphrasing slightly, um, mm -hmm. and more and more democracy is the answer to both, um, which feels very apt. Uh, feels very apt right now. Moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so you know, I, I know actually, I think there we are, should. Yeah, shall I? There are three questions okay. that I'd love okay, to great. Find. Thanks, Lila. I think mm -hmm. that they, I think that they all go really, really well together. So. Um, I want to mention that we have um, a little girl named Naomi who's on the call and she'd like to know how girls can save the planet. And I think that she asked that question right as Catherine was mentioning that finding your superpower is the most important thing. Like anyone can do their work, but there are a couple of questions in addition to Naomi's that I want to combine. Um, and Shivani says, I didn't study climate sustainability while I was in college. And now that I want to be a part of the movement in some way, I don't know how to fight. I don't feel like I have a path. How do you recommend someone wanting to switch paths, begin their path? How do you find your superpower? But I want to combine that with another question from Krista, who says, specifically for Janie, but I think that the whole group could answer this. You mentioned that community engagement is, a, is critical to successful adaption. What... Um, what was the most effective community engagement activity vehicle method that you and your colleagues use to ensure community buy-in and equity? Just on the lines of democracy there, I think that those kind of like, how do we engage as a community? How do we find our paths? These are pretty major questions. <laughs> we are we are really going for the big fish tonight, I will say. Um, all in one. Yeah. <laughs> all in one. Uh, I can jump in with a couple of thoughts on, on the first two, but I don't think I'm going to have the entire answers by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I think the first thing I will say is that um, girls are saving the planet. Uh, I mean, the leadership of girls and very young women has totally transformed the climate movement in the last two, three years. Um, and what I love about the way that they are doing the work is that it is incredibly collaborative. So I would say the best thing to do is to find another girl and another girl and another girl who all are either already engaged in this work or want to be, because there's like a welcoming in that folks are doing that I think is incredibly inspiring and incredibly necessary um and and they are they are bringing their kind of skills and talents and passions um to the movement right if they're great artists they're making art if they're great speakers they're speaking if they're um passionate about education they're you know cajoling schools into into teaching climate science and solutions um so i think uh don't try to go it alone is maybe the the way to sum that up. Um, and similarly, I think on finding your way in, um, I will say that I studied, I did studied religious, I majored in religious studies as an undergrad. Um, so I also was not, you know, a, a like sanctioned climate expert um, at, at 22. Um, I did end up deciding to go to grad school so that I could learn more deeply and do some, some research um, in the field. But I think being an interdisciplinarian is a really helpful and awesome thing in this space. I mean, Kate was talking um, about some of those dynamics. We need people who can help sort of turn the kaleidoscope. Um, and so I would say, don't sort of think that you have to abandon the area that you've been really interested and passionate about, um, but think about kind of where that might piece into the movement. Um, and again, I'll sort of speak from experience that before I ever had a job in climate, I was um, 
organizing, right, and involved in student activism. And that can be a great way to learn, to um, get connected with folks who do kind of do their day jobs in the space in one way or another. So I think also don't feel like you have to pay your rent <laughs> by working on climate change um, to get to get started. Um, but but joining joining a group or a campaign or a project within the movement can be a really good way good way to start. Jamie, do you want to jump in at all on that last one? I think we're actually going to try to close at 7:45, so maybe we could um, make a sort of a final a final thought, hoping to to wrap in some of that last question. Sure, I'm happy to. I, I mean, just building off of Catherine's point, you know, I think that if I reflect um, over my different experiences in climate adaptation, the thread has been that my job is to bring people together, people who often don't um, uh, come from the same discipline, um, share the same perspective, or even speak the same language. And so, you know, I, I, um, I think it's just really important to say and acknowledge that facilitation and, and convening people and actually getting to actionable outcomes is a skill, right? And, and, and um, I also, uh, you know, as, as a cultural anthropology and public policy major in college, um, there were no options to, to study climate change adaptation or sustainability. Often I um, get uh, inquiries from students who are trying to make a decision about what kind of grad school program to um, pursue and whether or not it's helpful to have a climate change degree. And I actually have no idea. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, in most of my hiring, I can say that I, I'm not looking at candidates with climate change degrees um, because a lot of those degree programs are quite new. Um, but to the point about community engagement, um, I will say there is no recipe, unfortunately, um, and I think we're still learning a lot about how to engage communities effectively in this work. Um, community engagement itself is not um, uh, uh, sort of the only way that we ensure equity in the work. Um, we rely a lot on data, um, making sure that we are making informed decisions about where to invest and how to invest before we invest. Um, and then, um, and then, of course, we want to make sure people's voices are at the table. I do a lot of listening. I think that's really important. Um, and we're, um, you know, trying to create spaces where we can really be visionary and imaginative as we're um, confronting the climate crisis. Um, like I said, I think that the adaptation planner's dream is to be able to um, realize multiple benefits and not just focus the conversation on what will make this community safe. Um, I think it's really limiting to just talk about safety. Um, and there's a certain certain resignation to that. So we're trying to be more expansive than that um, and, and keep um, uh, more possibilities on the table. Kate, any um, words of reflection on the bundle of questions that was presented for the, the, the little girl to uh, engagement and beyond? Sure. Um, so, I talked a lot about climate models and how I have a toy planet on my computer that I can do unspeakable things to. Um, but the thing about climate change is that it's not happening on my computer. It's happening here and it's happening in the world that we build for it. Um, and, and what that means is that every story is a climate story um, and climate touches every aspect of life. Um, so whatever you love, whatever you want to do, if you do it well and you do it with an eye toward making the world better, um, because five-year-olds grow up and five-year-olds become somebody's ancestor. And I want to leave a better world for you. And I want you to be able to be a better ancestor and leave a better world for your kids. Well, all right. Thank you so much, my co co conspirators, new friends, I suppose, through this through this process. And um, just again, Catherine and, and Ayana, who's uh, here somewhere. <laughs> um, I really um, just thanks for this gift of, of bringing us all together to me, I, you know, I, in terms of my, my own experience, I, I was one of these people who was made up my own major, tried through something called ecofeminism, pulled together anthropology, environmental science, uh, sculpture. And this was really, uh, you know, a book that I, 
didn't know existed and, and, and somehow would have been quite, you know, would, would have been a, a, such a grounding experience uh, for me at that time. And so I can only mm -hmm. hope that um, others, uh, you know, coming up into school and, 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 and sort of encountering the world and their role in it, um, that it can provide some, uh, some moments of, of, of wisdom and inspiration. It is a book that is inspiring and grounded and, and thank you guys all so much for participating tonight. So thank you so much and we'll see Thank everybody. you for hosting us, Kate. You bet. Okay. Thank you. Bye everybody.